Tests of the D'Urbervilles by Thomas Hardy. Chapter thirty five. Her narrative ended. Even its reassertions and secondary explanations were done. Tess's voice throughout had hardly risen higher than its opening tone. There had been no esculpatory phrase of any kind, and she had not wept. But the complexion even of external things seemed to suffer transmutation as her announcement progressed. The fire in the grate looked impish, demoniacally funny, as if it did not care in the least about her straight. The fender grinned idly as if it too did not care. The light from the water-bottle was merely engaged on a chromatic problem. All material objects around announced their irresponsibility with terrible iteration, and yet nothing had changed since the moments when he had been kissing her, or rather nothing in the substance of things, but the essence of things had changed. When she ceased, the auricular impressions from their previous endearment seemed to hustle away into the corners of their brains, repeating themselves as echoes from a time of supremely purblind foolishness. Clare performed the irrelevant act of stirring the fire. The intelligence had not even yet got to the bottom of him. After stirring the embers, he rose to his feet. All the force of her disclosure had imparted itself now. His face had withered. In the strenuousness of his concentration he treadled fitfully on the floor. He could not, by any contrivance, think closely enough. That was the meaning of his vague movement. When he spoke it was in the most inadequate, commonplace voice of the many varied tones she had heard from him. "'Tess!' "'Yes, dearest? Am I to believe this?' from your manner I am to take it as true. Oh, you cannot be out of your mind. You ought to be. Yet you are not. My wife, my Tess, nothing in you warrants such a supposition as that." "'I am not out of my mind,' she said. And yet—he looked vacantly at her, to resume with dazed senses—'Why didn't you tell me before? Ah, yes, you would have told me in a way, but I hindered you, I remember." These and other of his words were nothing but the perfunctory babble of the surface, while the depths remained paralysed. He turned away and bent over a chair. Tess followed him to the middle of the room where he was, and stood there staring at him with eyes that did not weep. Presently she slid down upon her knees beside his foot, and from this position she crouched in a heap. "'In the name of our love, forgive me,' she whispered with a dry mouth. "'I have forgiven you for the same.' And as he did not answer, she said again, "'Forgive me as you are forgiven. I forgive you, angel.' "'You, yes, you do. But you do not forgive me?' "'Oh, Tess, forgiveness does not apply to the case. You were one person. Now you are another. My God! How can forgiveness meet such a grotesque prestidigitation as that?" He paused, contemplating this definition. Then suddenly broke into horrible laughter, as unnatural and ghastly as a laugh in hell. "'Don't! Don't! It kills me quite that!' she shrieked. "'Oh, have mercy upon me! Have mercy!' He did not answer and sickly white she jumped up. "'Angel, angel, what did you mean by that laugh?' she cried out. "'Do you know what this is to me?' He shook his head. "'I have been hoping, longing, praying to make you happy. I have thought what joy it will be to do it. What unworthy wife I shall be if I do not. That's what I have felt, angel.' "'I know that.' "'I thought, angel, that you loved me me, my very self. If it is I you do love, oh, how can it be that you look and speak so? It frightens me. Having begun to love you, I love you for ever, in all changes, in all disgraces, because you are yourself. I ask no more. Then how can you, oh, my husband, 
stop loving me. I repeat, the woman I have been loving is not you. But who? Another woman in your shape. She perceived in his words the realization of her own apprehensive foreboding in former times. He looked upon her as a species of impostor, a guilty woman in the guise of an innocent one. Terror was upon her white face as she saw it. Her cheek was flaccid, and her mouth had almost the aspect of a round little hole. The horrible sense of his view of her so deadened her that she staggered, and he stepped forward, thinking she was going to fall. "'Sit down, sit down,' he said gently. "'You are ill, and it is natural that you should be.' She did sit down, without knowing where she was that strained look still upon her face, and her eyes such as to make his flesh creep. "'I don't belong to you any more, then, do I, Angel?' she asked, helplessly. "'It is not me, but another woman like me that he loved,' he says." The image raised caused her to take pity upon herself as one who was ill-used. Her eyes filled as she regarded her position further. She turned round and burst into a flood of self-sympathetic tears. Clare was relieved at this change, for the effect on her of what had happened was beginning to be a trouble to him only less than the woe of the disclosure itself. He waited patiently, apathetically, till the violence of her grief had worn itself out, and her rush of weeping had lessened to a catching gasp at intervals. Angel she said suddenly in her natural tones, the insane dry voice of terror having left her now. Angel, am I too wicked for you and me to live together? I have not been able to think what we can do. I shan't ask you to let me live with you, Angel, because I have no right to. I shall not write to mother and sisters to say we are married, as I said I would and I shan't finish the good hussif I cut out, I meant to make while we were in lodgings." "'Shan't you?' "'No, I shan't do anything unless you order me to. And if you go away from me, I shall not follow ye. And if you never speak to me any more, I shall not ask why, unless you tell me I may.' "'And if I do order you to do anything?' "'I will obey you like your wretched slave even if it is to lie down and die." "'You are very good. But it strikes me that there is a want of harmony between your present mood of self-sacrifice and your past mood of self-preservation." These were the first words of antagonism. To fling elaborate sarcasms at Tess, however, was much like flinging them at a dog or cat. The charms of their subtlety passed by her unappreciated and she only received them as inimical sounds, which meant that anger ruled. She remained mute, not knowing that he was smothering her affection for her. She hardly observed that a tear descended slowly upon his cheek, a tear so large that it magnified the pores of the skin over which it rolled, like the object lens of a microscope. Meanwhile, re-illumination as to the terrible and total change that her confession had wrought in his life, in his universe, returned to him, and he tried desperately to advance among the new conditions in which he stood. Some subsequent action was necessary, yet what? "'Tess,' he said, as gently as he could, "'I cannot stay in this room just now. I will walk out a little way.' He quietly left the room, and the two glasses of wine that he had poured out for their supper, one for her, one for him, remained on the table, untasted. This was what their agape had come to. At tea, two or three hours earlier, they had in the freakishness of affection drunk from one cup. The closing of the door behind, gently as it had been pulled to, roused Tess from her stupor. He was gone. She could not stay. Hastily flinging her cloak around her, she opened the door and followed, putting out the candles as if she were never coming back. The rain was over, and the night was now clear. She was soon close at his heels, 
for Clare walked slowly and without purpose. His form beside her light grey figure looked black, sinister and forbidding, and she felt as sarcasm the touch of the jewels of which she had been momentarily so proud. Clare turned at hearing her footsteps, but his recognition of her presence seemed to make no difference in him, and he went on over the five yawning arches of the great bridge in front of the house. The cow and horse tracks in the road were full of water, the rain having been enough to charge them, but not enough to wash them away. Across these minute pools the reflected stars flitted in a quick transit as she passed. She would not have known they were shining overhead if she had not seen them there. The vastest things in the universe imaged in objects so mean. The place to which they had travelled to-day was in the same valley as Talbothay's, but some miles lower down the river, and the surroundings being open she kept easily in sight of him. Away from the house the road wound through the meads, and along these she followed Clare without any attempt to come up with him or to attract him, but with dumb and vacant fidelity. At last, however, her listless walk brought her up alongside him, and still he said nothing. The cruelty of fooled honesty is often great under enlightenment, and it was mighty in Clare now. The outdoor air had apparently taken away from him all tendency to act on impulse. She knew that he saw her without irradiation, in all her barrenness, that time was chanting his satiric psalm at her then. Behold, when thy face is made bare, he that love thee shall hate. Thy face shall be no more fair at the fall of thy fate, for thy life shall fall as a leaf, and be shed as the rain and the veil of thine head shall be grief, and the crown shall be pain." He was still intently thinking, and her companionship had now insufficient power to break or divert the strain of thought. What a weak thing her presence must have become to him! She could not help addressing Clare. "'What have I done? What have I done?' I have not told of anything that interferes with or belies my love for you. You don't think how I planned it, do you? It is in your own mind what you are angry at, Angel. It is not in me. Oh, it is not in me, and I am not that deceitful woman you think me." Hm. Well, not deceitful, my wife. But not the same. No, not the same. But do not make me reproach you. I have sworn that I will not, and I will do everything to avoid it." But she went on pleading in her distraction, and perhaps said things that would have been better left to silence. "'Angel, Angel, I was a child, a child when it happened. I knew nothing of men.' "'You were more sinned against than sinning. That I admit.' "'Then will you not forgive me?' I do forgive you, but forgiveness is not all." "'And love me?' To this question he did not answer. "'Oh, Angel, my mother said that it sometimes happens so. She knows several cases where they were worse than I, and the husband has not minded it much, has got over it at last, and yet the woman has not loved him as I do you.' "'Don't, Tess, don't argue. Different societies different manners. You almost make me say you are an unapprehending peasant woman who have never been initiated into the proportions of social things. You don't know what you say. I am only a peasant by position, not by nature." She spoke with an impulse to anger, but it went as it came. "'So much the worse for you. I think that parson who unearthed your pedigree would have done better if he had held his tongue. I cannot help associating your decline as a family with this other fact, of your want of firmness. Decrepit families imply decrepit wills, decrepit conduct. Heaven! Why did you give me a handle for despising you more by informing me of your descent? Here was I thinking you a new-sprung child of nature. There were you, the belated seedling of an effete aristocracy. Lots of families are as bad as mine in that, 
Retty's family were once large landowners, and so were dairymen billets. And the Debbie houses, who are now carters, were once the Debye family. You find such as I everywhere. Tis a feature of our country, and I can't help it. So much worse for the country. She took these reproaches in their bulk simply, not in their particulars. He did not love her as he had loved her hitherto, and to all else she was indifferent. They wandered on again in silence. It was said afterwards that a cottager of Wellbridge, who went out late that night for a doctor, met two lovers in the pastures, walking very slowly without converse, one behind the other, as in a funeral procession, and the glimpse that he obtained of their faces seemed to denote that they were anxious and sad. Returning later he passed them again in the same field, progressing just as slowly and regardless of the hour and of the cheerless night as before. It was only on account of his preoccupation with his own affairs and the illness of his house that he did not bear in mind the curious incident, which, however, he recalled a long while after. During the interval of the cottager's going and coming she had said to her husband, "'I don't see how I can help being the cause of much misery to you all your life. The river is down there. I can put an end to myself in it. I am not afraid.' I don't wish to add murder to my other foibles," he said. I will leave something to show that I did it myself, on account of my shame. They will not blame you, then. Don't speak so absurdly. I do not wish to hear it. It is nonsense to have such thoughts in this kind of case, which is rather one for satirical laughter than for tragedy. You don't in the least understand the quality of the mishap. It would be viewed in the light of a joke by nine-tenths of the world, if it were known. Please oblige me by returning to the house and going to bed." "'I will,' she said dutifully. They had rambled round by the road which led to the well-known ruins of the Cistercian Abbey behind the mill, the latter having in centuries past been attached to the monastic establishment. The mill still worked on, food being a perennial necessity. The abbey had perished, creeds being transient. One continually sees the ministration of the temporary outlasting the ministration of the eternal. Their walk having been circuitous, they were still not far from the house, and in obeying his direction she only had to reach the large stone bridge across the main river and follow the road for a few yards. When she got back everything remained as she had left it, the fire being still burning. She did not stay downstairs for more than a minute, but proceeded to her chamber, whither the luggage had been taken. Here she sat down on the edge of the bed, looking blankly around, and presently began to undress. In removing the light towards the bedstead, its rays fell upon the tester of white dimity. Something was hanging beneath it, and she lifted the candle to see what it was. A bough of mistletoe. Angel had put it there, she knew that in an instant. This was the explanation of that mysterious parcel which had been so difficult to pack and bring, whose contents he would not explain to her, saying that time would soon show her the purpose thereof. In his zest and his gaiety he had hung it there. How foolish and inopportune that mistletoe looked now! Having nothing more to fear, having scarce anything to hope, for that he would relent there seemed no promise whatever, she lay down dully. When sorrow ceases to be speculative, sleep sees her opportunity. Among so many happier moods which forbid repose, this was a mood which welcomed it, and in a few minutes the lonely Tess forgot existence surrounded by the aromatic stillness of the chamber that had once, possibly, been the bride-chamber of her own ancestry. Later on that night Clare also retraced his steps to the house. Entering softly to the sitting-room he obtained a light, and with the manner of one who had considered his course he spread his rugs upon the old horsehair sofa which stood there, and roughly shaped it to a sleeping couch. Before lying down he crept shoeless upstairs, 
and listened at the door of her apartment. Her measured breathing told that she was sleeping profoundly. "'Thank God!' murmured Clare, and yet he was conscious of a pang of bitterness at the thought, approximately true, though not wholly so, that having shifted the burden of her life to his shoulders, she was now reposing without care. He turned away to descend, then, irresolute, faced round to her door again. In the act he caught sight of one of the d'Urberville dames, whose portrait was immediately over the entrance to Tess's bedchamber. In the candlelight the painting was more than unpleasant. Sinister design lurked in the woman's features, a concentrated purpose of revenge on the other sex, so it seemed to him then. The Caroline bodice of the portrait was low, precisely as Tess's had been when he tucked it in to show the necklace and again he experienced the distressing sensation of a resemblance between them. The check was sufficient. He resumed his retreat and descended. His air remained calm and cold, his small compressed mouth indexing his powers of self-control, his face wearing still that terrible sterile expression which had spread thereupon since her disclosure. It was the face of a man who was no longer passion's slave, yet who found no advantage in his enfranchisement. He was simply regarding the harrowing contingencies of human experience, the unexpectedness of things. Nothing so pure, so sweet, so virginal as Tess had seemed possible all the long while that he had adored her up to an hour ago. but the little less, and what worlds away!" He argued erroneously when he said to himself that her heart was not indexed in the honest freshness of her face. But Tess had no advocate to set him right. Could it be possible, he continued, that eyes which as they gazed never expressed any divergence from what the tongue was telling, were yet ever seeing another world behind her ostensible one, discordant? and contrasting. He reclined on his couch in the sitting-room and extinguished the light. The night came in and took up its place there, unconcerned and indifferent, the night which had already swallowed up his happiness, and was now digesting it listlessly, and was ready to swallow up the happiness of a thousand other people with as little disturbance or change of mien. End of chapter 35